sponsored by Geology. Iron Man, look, that tow truck ahead of us. I'll hold on to the tow chain while you drive. Okay, hang on. It's working! This is an episode from a long forgotten and almost impossible to get a hold of cartoon called The Marvel Superheroes. Five series revolving around Captain America, The Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, and Namor the Submariner aired back to back in the fall of 1966. Five new episodes per week, every week, in just 90 days. And then, nothing. They didn't make a significant cultural impact, and almost everyone forgot that they even happened. But whenever I get the chance, I always throw in a clip or two from these shows into my videos. They are so silly and goofy and terrible that I can't help but remind people that these cartoons exist. Disney doesn't want you to remember that they exist. They're not on Disney Plus, and there's pretty much no legitimate way to acquire these cartoons. I don't even have complete copies of the Marvel superheroes. All I have are a few clips that are available on YouTube and a very legal copy of Captain America that glitches out and skips large chunks of the story every couple of minutes. Like, this is how the origin of Cap looks in the copy that I have. In the greatest experiment of all. I drink quickly. This is his first test. I feel like there was probably some important stuff in there that got skipped over, but whatever. What I mean to say is that Disney, that's why Danny DeVito will always be his real dad. You get it. But I'll put an end to this two day long tangent about Disney's Hercules to focus once again on the main topic of this video, this bizarre series of Marvel cartoons from the 60s that no one ever seems to talk about. You'll regret that. You are wrong. My days of regretting are over. So what I want to do with this video is dive back in time to discover why this show was made, why it's so hard to find these days, and how in the middle of it all, there was a lawsuit going on that had the potential to change everything for Marvel's favorite star-spangled hero, had it not been for a public betrayal of friendship. Oh, that's right. The story behind this cartoon has everything. Drama, twists, a little robot that jiggles up and down. I don't know what that's about, but I love it. And there's only one place to start. Episode one. When Captain America throws his mighty shield, all those who chose to oppose his shield must yield. You ever wonder how Steve Rogers looks so good for being such an old man? Well, it's probably because of the combination of Super Soldier Serum and being frozen for decades that prevented him from aging too much, but it could also be because of today's sponsor, Geology. Now, if you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you know that I've been trying to get better at having a skincare routine this year. I'm almost 30 which is a surprisingly hard sentence to say out loud, I should start taking better care of my skin. If I want to keep being on camera, which I do, it's the only thing I'm halfway decent at. So long before they even sponsored me, I reached for Geology, a line of personalized skincare products that are tailored to your skin type and your lifestyle. And it couldn't be simpler. You take a questionnaire on their website to create your own unique regimen. If, for example, you find yourself with constant sunburn, like Red Skull, maybe you need a daily moisturizer with SPF. I think that's what his deal is. Can't remember, though. Much like the Red Skull, however, I'm bald. And when you don't have hair, there's really nowhere for all the oil that your scalp produces to go except to pile up on your face and cause acne. And that's why my personalized regimen, Regimen 32, includes a daily face wash that helps fight and prevent oil buildup and acne. The night cream is excellent as well and helps moisturize my skin overnight. Pair that with the under eye cream I use uh, to lighten up the dark circles that make it look like I lost a fight with a super soldier. 
or a regular person. I'm not very strong. But Geology's products are like super soldier serum for your face. They make skincare simple, but really effective, meaning it's easy for you to get great products that look after your skin. The regimens help create a simple morning and nighttime routine that's easier to stick to than adhesive X on Zemo's purple mask. I never realized before how many Captain America villains have face-related quirks. If you are interested in looking after your skin, I highly encourage you to click the link in the description below and head to Geology's website. Take their free skincare quiz and get up to 40% off when purchasing your first personalized trial set. And Here's even better news. If you are already using Geology as I have been, you can head to your account through the link below and upgrade your regimen. Plans start at just $20 and you can save up to 40% on your first purchase. Thank you so much to Geology for supporting the show, supporting my face, and potentially supporting Captain America's face. I don't know, Jerry's still out. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and as I'm sure we all know by now, Marvel comics were huge in the 60s. Superhero comics had all but died out, but Marvel was having a renaissance with new characters like the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, and so many others. Superheroes were back, and according to Sean Howe's Marvel Comics, The Untold Story, these vibrant Marvel comic books caught the attention of Robert Lawrence, a partner in Grand Trey Lawrence Animation. I wish I could list off an impressive portfolio of projects that Grand Trey Lawrence Animation produced, but they basically only had failed projects under their belt before this and didn't do much after this. But don't worry, we're gonna get back to them. Grand Trey Lawrence approached then editor-in-chief of Marvel, Martin Goodman. How do I not have a nameplate for him? And proposed a very lucrative one-sided deal. They wanted to produce an animated television series called The Marvel Superheroes, featuring the comic publisher's most popular characters, minus the Fantastic Four who had already been secured by Hanna-Barbera. They were initially going to use Spider-Man in the show as well, and even drew up some storyboards, but uh, both Marvel and Grand Trey Lawrence decided that Spidey was such a beloved character that they should really save him for bigger things down the road, which they did. And it was a show that blessed us with all kinds of delicious memes. Spider-Man was dropped from the lineup and replaced with obnoxious centrist Namor the Submariner, who joined Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, and of course, Captain America, whose cartoon will be the focus of this video. However, if you want me to do a deep dive into those other ones, uh, let me know below and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on those. I have to beg people to subscribe now. That's YouTube's policy. But for now, let's watch this piece of shit. The first episode of this cartoon focuses primarily on Cap's origin story. The world is at war, again, and Steve Rogers wants to enlist to help. Unfortunately, he's too scrawny to join in, so a smart scientist man gives him super soldier serum, and he turns into human golden retriever Chris Evans. But then, an enemy spy kills the scientist Dr. Erskine, and Steve has to stop him because... It's what I was created to do. But it's not like Steve does anything. The spy just kind of runs into some electrical science equipment and dies on his own. And the rest, as they say, is propaganda. Dr. Erskine is dead, and his formula died with him. So there can be no more like me. But I will champion the fight for freedom and justice wherever tyranny reigns. Bucky is the army base's teenage mascot, and I don't know what that means. Please tell me that's not a real thing that the military did with children. I'm too scared to look it up. Actually, this detail is amusing because according to the show's producer, Robert Lawrence, right before the show was getting ready to air, they brought in some last minute help to make sure that the show would be off to a great start. That help? None other than Stan Lee himself. This marked the very first time Stan was getting a taste of show business. And as we all know, Ah, oh, the man loved it. The studio put Stan up in a midtown penthouse apartment where he frantically scribbled extensive critiques of the show in its current format. Stuff like, the scientist character shouldn't use slang, or the final frame of this episode is weak, or we've gotta let the viewer know who Bucky is is, which is likely where we get the line about Bucky being the army base's teenage mascot. And while that gives us more information about Bucky, it still doesn't help as much as I would want it to. Take this exchange after Bucky uncovers that Steve is Captain America. What am I gonna do with you? Gosh, Cap, there's only one thing you can do. Now that I know your secret, let me be your partner. Looks like I've got no choice. Luckily, you've got what it takes, lad, so Put it there, partner. We have not seen Bucky do anything. 
what are you talking about? So yeah, I understand Stan's critique. Also, I guess it took Cap all night to think about it because the lighting immediately changes from nighttime to daytime here. But maybe your partner. Looks like I've got no choice. Anyway, Cap and Bucky train and fight some bad guys. There's this scene where the animators didn't want to animate water. Then we get on with the actual plot, where these villains, Sando and Omar, are performing shows where they predict the future and see all of these military attacks and explosions. I don't know why these two are villains. They aren't the ones committing these attacks. They just kind of warn people that they happen and then they happen. Can't have that. Cap and Bucky race to the theater to stop Sando and Omar, but they face their biggest obstacle yet. There'll be a short wait for seats. This is a character who did not need to be in this show, but what would my life be if he wasn't? Bucky and Cap go on to fight Sando and Omar. Agent 13 is also there for about four seconds and then never mentioned in the show again. But the big twist is that these goons work for the Red Skull. And I gotta say, I love how bizarre and dynamic the animations on his face are. Red Skull truly is one of the most realized characters in this cartoon. Whenever he's on screen, it's a fun time. In this episode, he's doing general sabotage stuff that ranges from making housekeepers of military leaders sniff sleeping gas to kidnapping people and putting them on planes and then crashing those planes. So you know how in New Girl, Winston's pranks are either way too small or they go, way too far. Yeah, it's like that. Red Skull will either kill people in extraordinarily violent and convoluted ways, or make someone take a brief afternoon nap. It's really up in the air. Unlike that plane. Red Skull ultimately gets away, leaving him to fight Cap and Bucky another day, which he absolutely will. And Steve goes back to being a spud peeling stud. The episode ends the same way it starts, with that uniquely catchy theme song that I've already played a few times for you in this video, because it has permanently carved out a spot in my brain where it will forever play on loop until I die. And that's episode one. Not a terrible start to this show. It's kind of hard to screw up Captain America's origin story, and they lifted it directly from the comics. Literally. You might notice that the animation in this show is animation in the broadest sense. It's mostly just zooming in and out on images, keyframing an otherwise motionless character to clunkily move across the screen, and occasionally having a character move their arm in a stiff robotic fashion. The most effort goes into syncing the lip movements up to the words, and very occasionally having some decent effects like smoke and fire and fight choreography. And three. Okay, maybe the fights are a little weak, but there are incredible, fluid, heart-pounding stunts. All right, not that either, but the acting is really where all the money went. He's like a tiger, pile on him! We need more bears! Get him, you guys! Grab a shield! Oh, I see. The problem is there was no money put into any part of this at all. Remember how I said that Grant Trey Lawrence made an extremely one-sided deal with Marvel to produce this show? Yeah, that's because Marvel had already done most of the legwork. To keep costs down, the production studio took images from previously published Captain America comic books and just kinda moved them around here and there. And I thought it would be distracting, but it really wasn't. Some of it works really well, to be honest. This continuous shot right here when Steve transforms into Captain America and then Erskine celebrates, but then the gunman charges into the room, it makes excellent use of the way that the camera zooms and pans to transform an otherwise static image into a moment that feels triumphant and then immediately suspenseful and tense. It's so good. However, other times the camera will pan to seemingly nothing, like if they applied a Ken Burns preset in post and just kind of trusted it to work out. Sometimes there would be just a shot of someone talking, but they didn't want to animate the mouth moving, so they just let you look at their crotch for a while. I can't explain not aging, but if you doubt my word, test me. Hey, nothing wrong with that. But the real benefit to producing a cartoon show this way is that the animators are working directly from the art of some of the great comic book masters like Jack Kirby and Don Heck. Kirby especially was known for his profoundly dynamic art style that made superheroes feel 
super. He could make static images come to life on the page with a mighty force and explosive drama. His art is an excellent template to work from to create a fast-paced, hard-hitting superhero show. Unfortunately, the animators seem to do everything in their power to make this dynamism feel slow and flat, and also real goofy. There's a lot of cartwheeling during action scenes, probably because it was an easy movement to animate. You just take a character and spin them around. That's disappointingly some of the best action <laughs> in this show. Although other times uh, they take it to a different extreme, like this moment. So be it. <laughs> that was simultaneously a lot and also nothing. It's also a little strange that they kept in the visual sound effects while adding audible sound effects. I imagine it was probably because the Adam West Burt Ward Batman TV series came out that same year and proved to be a surprising smash hit. I did a whole video about that series and Patrick Willems did a more recent and better video about the movie recently. I'll have both of those linked below if you want to check them out. But famously, if you didn't know in that show, the sound effects would appear on screen during fights and I'd wager that the people behind this cap cartoon thought to copy that style just because. And ultimately, I mean, that's fine, but I almost wish they had just used musical stings like the Batman TV show instead of actual sound effects because the sounds they chose are bad. See what a karate do in the hands of a master can do. Sometimes they don't even fit the action. Zemo throws a punch at one point and there's a bite sound effect. <laughs> But I'm getting ahead of myself. There are 13 episodes of this cartoon and we've only covered one. So let's pace through a couple more. I wanna to get to the episodes with Zemo in them. Those are excellent. Episode two brings back Red Skull who instructs a POW to escape capture and steal a top secret weapon known as Project Vanish. Oh, also this is a fun recurring bit. For some reason, almost every episode of this show features gas of some kind. Everyone's always knocking each other out with gas or escaping with a gas grenade. Gas abounds. Turns out Project Vanish is just a gun that makes matter disappear, but there is this incredible moment that made me laugh. Fire a warning shot. Later, Cap and Bucky get assigned mandatory rest time against their will, which is a lot like how my brain works when I'm in the middle of a video project, like this one. Gosh, Steve, why are you so against taking a rest? I don't know. I mean, I haven't put out many videos this year and it's already May somehow, and I just keep losing subscribers year after year because they don't seem to like the new direction that I've been taking the channel, and so I just, think that if I put every ounce of myself into bigger and bigger projects that maybe, hopefully, one day one of them will take off even though they inevitably don't. Because the Red Skull and his leader never rest in their evil efforts to conquer the free world. Oh yeah, that too. Cap gets captured by the Red Skull and is hypnotized into being his servant. He has been drugged. Look at his eyes. Uh, I can't really see. It's, you chose to do like a wide shot here, so I can't quite make out his eyes. You know what? It's fine. I trust you. At the last crucial moment, Cap returns to normal. I should not have trusted you. Episode three is all about Bucky, which means it's boring. He gets kidnapped by a mad scientist when someone lightly boops him on his head, so now Cap has to rescue Bucky, but he yet again succumbs to a vague gas. The scientist works for an enemy military leader who wants to load Bucky and Cap into a rocket and then launch the rocket to crash somewhere, I'm sure, killing them both. But Cap recovers from the gas and says the most baffling one-liner. I launch my own rocket. What does that mean? Cap then cartwheels his way to victory against the vague, unnamed enemy threats. Yeah, I guess now is as good a time as any to point out something weird about this show. Aside from all the obvious stuff. So at some point, someone behind the show made the creative decision to erase all of the mentions of Nazis from these early Cap stories. Captain America was created very specifically to be anti-Nazi. I made an enormous video about the innate politics of Captain America's creation a few years ago if you want to watch that. But in this cartoon, 
they get rid of all of that. Who are America and the rest of the world at war with? I don't know. The show just refers to the evil troops as the enemy. And any appearances of Hitler from the comics are replaced by generic military looking people. That's what happened in these last two episodes. In the comic, when Red Skull brainwashes Cap, he takes him directly to Hitler, as opposed to this nobody character in the cartoon. In the scuffle with the rocket and many other stories from the comics, Cap and Bucky fought Nazis directly. Not so in the TV show. Now, normally I wouldn't complain about a lack of Nazis. The fewer the better. It's just an odd choice given the context that these stories come from. I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a cartoon intended for children, but the original comics were also intended for children. And why would it be so wrong to show kids that Nazis suck? Even back then were people thinking, well, we can't have our, our show be political, so let's take out all the Nazis and leave in everything else because that was the only thing political about a show with a soldier named Captain America, right? It's just a little strange to me. Unless we got rid of all the Nazis by 1966. Hey, Tristan from the YouTube channel Step Back History, did we get rid of all the Nazis by 1966? Nope, they're still here. Rats. Oh well. That's really the last significant time it would come up in the cartoon anyway, because episode four is the start of Cap's modern adventures. After being frozen during a mission gone wrong, Cap wakes up after 20 years in ice. Yeah, it's just 20 years in the original comics since Cap debuted in the 40s and was revived in 1964 in Avengers number four. Speaking of the Avengers, I love the hero shot they have in this episode. We are known as the mighty Avengers. Look at Iron Man. Look at Giant Man. They would rather be doing anything else right now. The Avengers get turned into stone and Cap rescues them, but the villain escapes to an old building. You can tell it's an old building because it's labeled Old Building. It's possible that's another thing they took from Batman. The drinking water dispenser is clearly marked. All right. Thank you very much, sir. The evil man, whose name I genuinely have forgotten, wants to take down the Avengers by first taking out Captain America. Because, as he explains, The only one without superpowers is Captain America. Uh, I would argue that most of them don't have superpowers, since Iron Man and Giant Man and the Wasp all need outside technology to grant them superhuman abilities, while Steve Rogers' body is pumped full of super soldier serum that makes him abnormally strong and dexterous. He's just a glorified acrobat. Yeah, that part's true, though. Have you seen him do cartwheels? His henchmen attack Cap while he's alone, and... Go on! Give a shot of that sleeping gas! More gas! More gas! Cap wins by the end of the episode, obviously, but now we get to the main event, in my opinion. Zemo. It is dangerous to pry into Zemo's secrets. Mankind has been saved from the master. No, come on, come on, dang it. I just want to watch my purple mask boy be evil at people, but all I have are these corrupted copies of this cartoon. I need to find high quality, complete versions of this show. Somehow. I mean, there must have been a DVD release at some point. I gotta do some digging. Okay, so as we know by now, the original production company was Grand Trey Lawrence Animations. The original distributor, however, was Krantz Films. This show premiered in 1966, and by 1967, Grand Trey Lawrence went bankrupt. Uh, the cartoons obviously didn't cement themselves into pop culture as they had hoped. And when they folded, Krantz Films took over everything. Krantz Films was bought by a company named Vicoa, which I can't find any information about at all online. And here's when we start running into words like somehow and apparently, because there's a striking lack of information regarding what happened to this series between 1967 and today. So fair warning, the rest of this segment might be wrong, but this is the best I've been able to uncover in many weeks of sleepless research. Somewhere along the way, Fox released a VHS home video collection that I've only been able to find one or two pictures of, and I don't even know what year that happened. Buena Vista Entertainment, aka Disney, somehow got the rights to all the cartoons in 2004 and did fully release a Spider-Man set 
but nothing else. They slated to release the whole Marvel superhero show in 2005, but then they just didn't do that. Apparently, a pre-order for these Buena Vista DVDs did appear on Amazon thanks to an archived blog post I found from the early 2000s, but then when I searched for it on Amazon, I, I did find a listing for it, but the image on the listing is of some iPhone charging cables. So I don't know if it was ever released. At this point, I was getting frustrated. I just wanted to know if this show ever had an official release by any company. So I asked friend of the show, Mopey, to help me uncover who the rights holders are for this cartoon. And after a couple days of research, he still hasn't gotten back to me. Oh, hey, there he is now. Uh, yeah, it looks like he just sent me an audio file through Discord. So yeah, I guess we'll just play it. <laughs> I don't know. Could be in Canada, could be in the UK, could be in Disney's office, could be in some random guy's car, could be with me, I don't know, probably with Disney, I still don't know. <laughs> okay, so that sounds like an infinite void of sadness that I dare not stare into any longer. I did find copies on Amazon that you can buy from a UK company called Clear Vision from anywhere between $80 to $230. Yeah, I don't have the budget for that. So I did what we all do when we need to obtain obscure historic relics. After only a few minutes of searching, oh success, I found a listing for a cap DVD for only $30 instead of $230. And I got it shipped here in just two days from a guy named Paul. Thanks, Paul. I don't know why it was this hard to find a legit copy like this on other sites. I mean, yeah, sure, the cover's a bit off in size and quality. Maybe these things were just cheaply made. Although another weird thing is that the episode order on the back is not the order I'd expect these to be in. Most places list the origin of Captain America as episode one, naturally, but it's listed here as episode four for some reason. And that's really just the start. Every single episode is in a wildly different order than how the wiki says it should be, except for episode uh, 10 for some reason. That one is in its proper slot. Everything else though, chaos. But no matter, that's just little stuff. Let's open her up and watch the official copies of... Yeah, I should have expected that. Okay, so clearly these aren't official releases of the cartoon, but I'm still curious to see what's on these little discs. Could be anything, so I'm a little worried. Uh, small issue that I didn't think about before ordering this DVD. None of our computers at the office have DVD drives to even play whatever's on here. The only thing we had was an Xbox, and I'm pretty sure we haven't turned that on in about three years, which meant that I had to wait for the Xbox to update for an entire hour. But when that was done, I restarted it and I was able to play the, just kidding, it needed a second update. I danced for a little bit to kill time. Can you tell how much fun I was having? Then I had to download an app that could actually play the DVDs. Cause I guess the Xbox can't just do that on its own. After all of that was done, I was ready to hit play, but then the controller died on me. Oh my God kidding me. You know, I just love when technology gets out of your way and melts into the background like this. Really innovative. But finally, I was able to load up the DVD and... When Captain America throws his mighty shield... I can't believe it. Not only did this have all 13 episodes, but they were the highest quality versions of the cartoon I've been able to find anywhere. Just look at the quality difference here. So good, so crisp. You can actually see the letter A on Cap's head during the intro sequence. It's not just some weird smudge. Sure, it's got lots of grain and scratches and YouTube's compression is probably making it look worse, but I promise you, these are the best looking copies I can find. They are stellar on my end. Why is it so hard to find an official release of these? Why do I need to rely on some guy named Paul to watch these in full weight? Could be in Canada, could be in the UK, could be in Disney's office, could be in some random guy's car, could be in some random guy's car. Some random guy's car. Are you the sole owner of this cartoon, Paul? Are you where this series landed? What are your secrets, Paul? 
I have to know them. Anyway, now we get to watch the actual episodes with Zemo. Episodes five and six focus on the good boy Baron Zemo, who aside from the Red Skull is by far the most memorable villain in this series. I just enjoy his look a whole lot. The fur lined jacket and the purple mask that he's somehow able to see out of without any eye holes. The way he always shakes his fist at everything. Seriously, every single time they cut to Zemo in this cartoon, it's of the same image where he's shaking his fist. In these two episodes alone, they cut to this shot dozens of times. It's fantastic. Also, I guess I never really knew this, but Zemo's whole thing was that he was working on an advanced adhesive for vague evil purposes, but Captain America shattered a tank full of it with his shield, and it glued Zemo's mask to his face. To say that I'm disappointed that we never saw that happen in Falcon and Winter Soldier would be a severe understatement. I mean, for one thing, I too know the intense torture of peeling off a mask that you've accidentally glued to your face. It would be nice to know that someone else out there understands that incredibly specific pain. Ow. 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 It was not a fun day. There's a lot of adhesive related hijinks in this episode. The Black Knight sprays glue all over the city. Radioactive Man also glues things. Melter <gasps> melts things. Oh. And then he glues them down. Oh, thank God. Now I'll trap you forever with Zemo's adhesive. You missed. No, he didn't. It hit my knee. I'm pinned to the ground, helpless. I've seen this adhesive before. It's the work of Zemo. Right. Yeah, no, he just said that it was- Zemo's adhesive. The Avengers reversed the glue and Cap faces off against Zemo. Surprised, Zemo? I thought I had rid myself of you. I still live and I still fight. I too am a fighter! I love this whole sequence. I don't know why. It's terrible, but it's full of great moments, like the crunch punch from earlier. <laughs> And this oof hit that I turned into a reaction gif because it feels like it will be handy on Twitter. I said that in a fun way. Twitter. Twitter. Just mushing consonants together. Thor tornadoes Zemo away, and that's the last we hear from him. For at least the three or four seconds it took me to load up the next episode because Zemo is immediately back, baby! It's revealed in episode six that he's the villain responsible for Bucky's death 20 years ago when Cap was frozen. So you can imagine that facing down Zemo again in the present started bringing up painful memories for Steve about the death of his sidekick and friend. Once again, I feel a wave of depression surging over me. But Rick Jones doesn't care. He puts on Bucky's old uniform that they have for some reason and charges at Cap like, hey, look at me. I look just like your friend that died. Isn't that interesting? This is, understandably, profoundly upsetting for Steve. I didn't think it would make you so mad. Really? Zemo is hiding out in the Amazon. I guess that's where Thor's tornado took him. He sends henchmen to kidnap Cap, and the goons must have picked up a few moves from Zemo, because their attacks also sound like bites. They don't capture Cap, but they do manage to kidnap Rick. Oh, hey, look, Rick, I guess you are kind of like Bucky after all. This is the easiest reward we've ever earned from Zemo. Zemo? So he's behind this. Yes, Rick, the henchmen just introduced themselves to you by saying, I have a message from Zemo. Zemo, my most deadly enemy. What is going on with people forgetting about Zemo seconds after villains say that they're working for Zemo? You know, maybe he just needs to shake his fist some more. Oh, thank God he's doing it. And he's still doing it. And Cap goes to the Amazon to save Rick and Zemo launches a missile that fires right between Cap's legs. And I really thought that animation was gonna end differently. Well, at least the missile had gas in it. Gas, deadly gas. I've got to do something fast. Right, yes, of course. What are you gonna do, Cap? I've got to do something fast. I made it. Oh, okay. You're just gonna wait it out and do nothing. Uh, cool. So there's this big fight that happens on the ground and it's Banners because they reuse a ton of footage to the point where I felt like I accidentally discovered a rift in time and was permanently stuck watching this cartoon on repeat forever. Uh, here's this bit where Cap pole vaults through the air. The first time they use this clip, he falls into a pit in the ground. A few minutes later, when they use this clip again, he lands on Zemo's mercenaries. 
Then we see Cap swatting a tree into a big gun, and we get the exact same shot again, just moments later. And it's played like they're totally different. The first time, the henchmen were using a Vibra gun, whatever that is. Hit him with the Vibra gun! The second time, it's a grenade gun. Turn the grenade gun on it! Two radically different weapons. I mean, y you can't tell the difference between these two? Cap reflects sunlight off of his shield to disorient Zemo, who stumbles around and accidentally buries himself under an avalanche of boulders. The masked monarch is dead, and Bucky's death is avenged, almost like Cap is some sort of avenging good hero. It's gotta be a shorter way to say that. But either way, this dark chapter from Steve's past comes to a close. These episodes are great because they perfectly encapsulate Cap as a superhero, fighting battles both past and present. And while this cartoon was never a raging success, it still got people's attention. More and more fans were tuning into the thrilling adventures of Captain America, which led to more interest in the Captain America comic books from where these grand tales of superhero action originated. Captain America was becoming increasingly more well-known in pop culture. And that was starting to be a problem. You see, while this show was airing, potentially while these exact episodes were hitting television screens across the country, Marvel Comics was in hot water. Joe Simon, the co-creator of Captain America, filed a lawsuit against Marvel and Krantz Films, the distributor of this cartoon, over the rights to the Sentinel of Liberty himself. So Captain America premiered in the comics in 1941 and was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Now again, I've done an enormous video about the real world origins of Captain America if you haven't seen it. It's a lot of history and context breakdown, but the gist of it is that Simon and Kirby were great friends who loved writing comics together. So when publisher Martin Goodman came around asking Joe Simon to head up Timely Comics, which would later be known as Marvel Comics, Simon only agreed if Goodman also hired Jack Kirby. And just keep that in mind. Joe Simon was directly responsible for getting Jack Kirby hired at Marvel, where he would go on to co-create pretty much all of your favorite Marvel superheroes. But before that, Simon and Kirby were just good pals who loved drawing together. Goodman tasked the duo with creating a new superhero that could put timely comics on the map. Simon and Kirby dreamed up a star-spangled superhero with a big striped shield. And right at the top of the page, Joe Simon scrawled the name Captain America, and an iconic hero was born. And Simon held on to this sketch for years and years and years. In fact, he kept extensive records of his art and projects that he worked on over the decades. This is why when he filed against Marvel for the rights to Captain America, Marvel couldn't just brush it off as they had done with other artists who attempted the same legal action. Martin Goodman was worried that Joe Simon might actually have a strong case against them. Marvel's only hope of discrediting Joe Simon was to get Jack Kirby, the other co-creator of Captain America, to turn on his friend. It was a tricky spot to be in for Kirby. On the one hand, he didn't want to testify against his longtime collaborator and pal, but on the other hand, Joe Simon was claiming to be the sole creator of Captain America, effectively erasing Kirby from the story entirely. Now, Martin Goodman saw how much this was bugging Kirby, so he leaned in to this insecurity to pressure Kirby into siding with Marvel in the case. He'd say things like, oh, Simon said he created Captain America. He wants the copyright and looks like you're out. To further swing Kirby to his side, Goodman offered him a deal. If Kirby sided with Marvel in the dispute, the company would pay him the same settlement that Simon would get. Marvel keeps the rights, both the co-creators get a cash payment, and everyone walks away, pretends like this whole thing never happened. And in the end, that was enough 
to get Kirby on Marvel's side against his longtime friend, Joe Simon. Kirby wrote in his deposition, quote, I felt like whatever I did for Timely belonged to Timely, as was the practice in those days. When I left Timely, all of my work was left with them, end quote. This weakened Joe Simon's case, and the parties did end up settling for reportedly $7,500 or about $54,000 today. But while Joe Simon got his part of the settlement, it was unclear if Jack Kirby ever did. He went through the entire ordeal, and it's possible that Marvel never kept their side of the agreement to match the settlement. And that is infuriating, especially when you learn that Kirby did more than just testify against his friend. In what I can only imagine was an emotionally difficult assignment, Kirby drew up two new costumes for Captain America just in case Marvel lost the case and couldn't use the classic design that Simon created. Amazingly, these drafts have survived the test of time. Here's this one right here. I actually really love the gloves and boots and the giant belt with the star in it, but the striped deep V really isn't doing it for me. Good news though, the other design is much worse. It throws blue out of the color scheme entirely in favor of yellow and lots of gray stripes. This is clearly the worst of the two designs, but it's also, to my knowledge, the only one that Kirby repurposed later since Marvel never needed these costumes in the end. Yeah, the classic one that we know and love is still around today. But this was not the end of the lawsuits that Simon pursued against Marvel over the rights to Captain America. This was just the first one. And typically, I'd take a few minutes to explain the others because they are equally as fascinating, but the specifics are a bit challenging to wrap my head around. You know, if only there was some sort of handsome and lawful bird of prey who knew a lot more about this that could stop by and explain it to me, but oh well. Holy litigation, it's the eagle sign. Someone's talking about the law on the internet. Oh, hey, it's Legal Eagle here to rescue me from the hole that I dug trying to pretend like I knew anything about law stuff. Yeah, well, anytime someone is talking about the law on the internet, I will be there. Oh man, I really wish I wrote you into the script like five minutes ago when I first started this whole section, but you know what, you're here now and that makes my job a lot easier. Take it away. Yeah, after Joe Simon and Marvel settled their lawsuit in the 1960s, Congress stepped in and actually extended the copyright term many different times. A lot of people attribute this to Disney wanting to never lose the copyright over Mickey Mouse. But the truth is, today it stands where usually the copyright associated with any given work is the life of the author who created it plus 70 years. Or sometimes if it is a work for hire or a corporation does it, then the copyright lasts for 120 years. And as Part of the deal in extending the copyright term from where it was in the 1960s to where it is in the present day, Congress also allowed, under certain circumstances, for authors to claw back licenses and assignments that they had made to corporations. And this was a big deal to Joe Simon because as part of the litigation, he assigned his copyright to Marvel Studios. So what Congress did is under section 304 of the Copyright Act, they basically said under certain circumstances, if you gave up those rights, you can then terminate them given certain notice provisions and then the rights revert to the people that actually created it in the beginning. And you see this with a lot of musicians who had bad deals with record labels. You see this with authors and you see it with people that created characters for comic books. So after the initial term had expired, Joe Simon tried to exercise his termination rights and he sued Marvel again in 1999, saying that he was exercising his right to terminate his assignment and that the uh, Captain America rights would then revert back to him. This was a big deal. Uh, Simon actually lost in the trial court and he appealed this decision all the way up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is one step below the US Supreme Court. And the Court of Appeals sided with Simon. They didn't say he outright won, but he said it was possible that he had a claim. And so they remanded the case back down to the trial court where Simon litigated with uh, Marvel once again. But given that Simon had already won the most important legal issue with respect to whether he could possibly exercise 
his termination, then Marvel and Joe Simon settled once again. The terms of that settlement are not publicly known. The settlement was reached in 2003. You can bet that this was for a lot more money than Simon got in the 1960s. Though at the same time, this was the very early days of uh, superhero movies. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man had just come out. The Marvel Cinematic Universe didn't exist at that time. So it was far less money than he probably would have gotten later on. But if Marvel hadn't gotten the rights to Captain America back, maybe they wouldn't have even made all of the Avengers movies in the first place because they might not have made those movies with the title and the, the cloud to the copyright. So it's probably a better result for everyone than what happened in the 1960s. But at the end of the day, Joe Simon might have come out victorious, even if it took 50 years for that to happen. Huh, a, a real shame that it took that long, but I'm glad it at least worked out a little better than I would have thought. Hey, thanks for stopping by to cover all this. I really appreciate it. Until next time at the same Eagle time, same Eagle channel. Okay, we gotta stop making Batman references. But these footnotes are taking up like most of the video at this point. We gotta speed run through the rest of these. Episode seven is a big fever dream with this close up of Cap's face. You're welcome. It's also got this bouncy little robot outside of AIM headquarters. I love this little dude. Episode eight is not interesting, mostly just the Avengers fighting. Episode nine is not interesting, mostly just the Avengers fighting. Episode 10, however, is not interesting. It's mostly just the Avengers fighting. Although it finally gives an introduction for Wanda, Pietro, and Hawkeye after they've already been established characters in the show for the past two episodes. This is Quicksilver. This is his sister Wanda. The Scarlet Witch, the third of the newcomers, is named Hawkeye. And hey, it's been a few episodes, so you guessed it. More gas, more gas. Episode 11 is interesting because it's revealed that the Red Skull laid some long-term plans after his death to destroy the world. The episode is called The Sleeper Shall Awake, and I thought that would mean like sleeper agents waking up and wreaking havoc on behalf of the Red Skull, but no, it's actually three giant robots that come together and form one bigger robot, Zord style, called The Sleeper. Only the Red Skull could have conceived such a mind-staggering plan. We've got a robot that's the body, a robot that's the wings, and a robot that's the head. And I'll let you guess where the head goes on this robot body. You're wrong, it goes here. Only the Red Skull could have conceived such a mind-staggering plan. Overall though, this is a perfect episode. Cap's been teaming up with the Avengers for the past few outings, and this one feels like a return to form, facing off solo against one of the Red Skull's evil plans. It's thrilling from start to finish. The action never lets up, and the climactic ending weighs heavy with tension. If I had to recommend one episode to watch out of this whole show, it's this one which might be why the DVD recommends watching it first, even though it's wildly out of order. Episode 12 is good because Bad Track the Leaper says Sacre Bleu to everything. Sacre Bleu, Sacre Bleu, Sacre Bleu. And finally, episode 13, The Red Skull Lives. Oh, that's right, he's back, baby. No, not the tomato head guy. I'm talking about the bouncy aim robot. He's back and he's still a delight. Look at him go. What is he up to? I have to know. This episode is excellent. It feels like what the entire show was leading up to. You start the whole series with Cap battling against the Red Skull and you close the series the same way, except now they're both 20 years in the future. A lot has changed in the world but you witness how these two characters are true to their core, never wavering in what they believe. There's colorful superhero action, moments of self-reflection, psychological warfare, aerial combat, and the Red Skull even gets a hold of Cap's shield at one point. It's awesome. This time, the Red Skull discovers the Cosmic Cube and almost vanishes Cap to an alternate dimension. But, at the last moment, Cap knocks the cube out of the Red Skull's grasp, sending it plummeting into the ocean below. Focused on nothing else around him, the Red Skull dives into the water, only to be caught in an avalanche of falling rocks that also hides the cosmic cube from ever being found again. These final shots show the Red Skull entombed in a watery grave beneath the ocean, 
while Cap stands triumphant above the sea, looking out at the sunset, knowing that his mission to stop his first foe is finally, truly, over. And that's the show. It's not great, and I don't imagine people are exactly screaming for it to be available on Disney+, Plus. but I think it's a fascinating piece of lost media. The fact that I had to go through so much just to get high quality copies of this cartoon is annoying, but even if it was available on Disney+, Plus, I, I probably wouldn't recommend watching the whole show. Maybe just an episode or two to get a feel for it, but otherwise it's a bit of a slog to get through, and it's only 13 episodes. But what have we learned through all this, though? What's the point of making a video like this at all? What are the life lessons that we can take away from this cartoon? Well, in my opinion, capitalism is you now, and, and to me, that's a message that I wish I would have heard growing up. So, I hope that helps you wherever you're at in your life. And if it doesn't, take some gas. <laughs> <laughs>. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure to like it and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and leave a comment down below if you want me to talk about the rest of the shows in this series. I think at the very least, the Namor one could be a disaster. If you don't know, all of my videos are up a week early and ad-free on Patreon, and occasionally they have bonus content. For example, I talked even more in depth about the lawsuit and how it led to an iconic artist being hired at Marvel. Uh, but this video was running too long for YouTube already, so that part is just available over on Patreon. If you wanna get your eyes on that and support me on Patreon, just like Amanda Trisdale, Christopher Lang, Donna Bark, Edwin Latour, Eric Totora Pato, Everett Parrott, Havelock Smiggles, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, and the rest of the wonderful nerds by going to patreon.com slash nerdsing. My goal this year is to hit 2,000 patrons, as I said last time, to keep making cool things on this channel. The current check at the time I'm writing this video is 434, so keep it going, gang. The link is in the description if you wanna check out how you can best support me in these videos, so thanks so much. Click or tap right here to learn more about the real world origin behind the creation of Captain America. It's that video that I teased several times throughout this video, or click or tap right here to see something that YouTube's algorithm recommends. Until next time, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics and cartoons. See ya. This was a mistake.